so. Um, well, so I guess, you know, let's just get started with the first one. What is the biggest misconception about how elections are ran in Washington or Spokane, do you think? I think the biggest misconception is that elections officials can have any kind of influence over the outcome of the election. Vote by mail is built on controls. It's on controls to make sure that it is, in fact, the voter who has received their ballot, returned it, we verify the signatures, and then when we count, we make sure that the number of envelopes we've gotten in matches the number of ballots. The machines are tested over and over again. They are not hacked. And also, if you want the ultimate test, the ultimate audit, go take a look at the Spokane County webpage, Elections Archives Recounts. 17 recounts since 2001, and look how close the numbers are. They're dead, they're almost dead on on everyone. That's the ultimate test. Oh, you really need to tell me because otherwise I will. I know, I know, but I probably won't cut you off. Um, so, you know, after the 2020 election, there were a number of concerns that could be spread about um, widespread fraud and the results, and I think a lot of misinformation swirling about how elections were conducted. Is there any truth to any of the questions that came up about the country's elections systems integrity? The elections process, the elections administration, is not perfect. Some small mistakes are made. There's no doubt about it. There's no perfect system. But what we do is very tightly controlled and very accurate. I think there are misconceptions, allegations, uh, misinformation and disinformation being spread because people didn't like the result. I'm sorry, you know, when there's two candidates, one wins, one loses. It can be tough for the losing side to accept that. And sometimes it's incredibly close. But overall, across the country and here in Washington State, our systems are accurate. It is the voter's ballot. There, sometimes there's a mistake there, I admit it, but not enough to change the outcome of an election. And you know, on that last point, how common is fraud in Spokane County, or if you can speak to, you know, to broader Washington State elections? Fraud is a, a very low percentage. What we have been able to identify over the years um, in the 2020, I believe it was, general election, we ended up with eight ballots being counted for voters who were deceased at the time the ballots were submitted. And so those were obviously frauds or forgeries. So again, system isn't perfect, but when you're looking at counting about 282,000 ballots, that is a very low percentage of fraud. Um, and statistics from the 2020 election have shown that statewide ballot rejection rates are higher for people of certain age, race, or ethnicity. Uh, how do you, as a county auditor, or how might you want to address some of those discrepancies? So we go through training with the Washington State Patrol to learn how to match signatures. And if anybody's watched that process, you know that we're not actually seeing the name of the person. When you're doing that work, you're really just seeing an image. You're not reading a printed name. You're not reading the written name, even. You're just looking at two images and comparing them. And the human brain does that very, very well. You don't have the time as you're moving through that to stop and read the name. So we're not looking at it for age, for ethnicity. What we're looking at is just, are the images the same? Do they have particular characteristics that are the same? Why would some voters have their signatures rejected more than others? Okay, let's talk about the, the younger voters, the 18 to 24s. Most 18 to 24 year olds, their signature will change by the time they're 28 to 30. And it's in that time period where more of their signatures get rejected. 
We also have some issues with certain ethnic groups, which may have a, a variety of different ways that they sign their names. They may not always use the same set of names in that signature. And that can be really tough when you don't have much to compare and they look very different. So there is a study that was done. The Secretary of State's office and the 39 county auditors are working together to see if we can find those particular reasons why there may be groups across the state where their signatures are rejected more frequently than others. And if you get a chance, uh, I don't have the exact web address for that particular study, but what's interesting is it's different around the state. So Spokane is, is pretty much on the low end of any kind of signature rejections in comparison to some of the other counties. But the groups that are being rejected at a higher rate in different counties is different. So there's no set pattern that's statewide. Um, and we've seen in, I think, the last couple of weeks um, that former Representative Matt Shea is organizing people to watch over uh, ballot boxes. And we, on the west side, you know, there was an issue during the primary, I think, of, of folks watching over drop boxes. So do you have concerns about that? And, and how safe are our drop boxes in Spokane County? So most of our drop boxes are located at uh, brightly lit and well-maintained public buildings. So public libraries, city halls, the uh, STA plaza, and then of course up at the county courthouse. So the ballot boxes themselves are very secure. And one of the things to remember about the state of Washington is since at least the 1920s, we've had a law on the books that allows people to come in and observe the election process. This is codified in our state statute. So we have, I think now, well over 80 certified election observers from the Republican Party and Democratic Party who come in and can watch the process in our processing center, which is where the ballots come into, the images are verified, envelopes open, the ballots tabulated, as well as our voter service centers, which are where you can go in as a voter, get a replacement ballot, or vote in person. And that's center place for Monday and Tuesday of election week. And then of course the elections office throughout the whole cycle. Um, the student engagement hubs, which we only have one here at EWU. And then also people can watch the drop boxes. But in all of those instances, an observer, whether they're a certified election observer or just someone who wants to watch, cannot interfere in the process. You cannot impede a voter. You cannot attempt to influence the voter in their vote or not to vote at all. So that's the thing I want to make clear to all the voters. You have rights. You have the right to cast your ballot and deliver it unimpeded so if you do run into a problem, feel free to call the office, or if you feel intimidated or threatened, call 911. The idea of, of poll watching, I think, has come up in recent years. Do you think that this, the um, observer program that you were talking about needs to be changed or expanded in any way in Washington to kind of address some of those concerns from folks? Well, first of all, we don't have polls. And any place that, we, that is set up to be voting, such as the elections office where people can come in in person or center place, that is covered by the observer rules. So Washington is really an incredibly open and transparent state for being able to watch everything that happens, all the way from the point of designing the ballots to um, getting them inserted, sending them through the mail, being able to watch them come in, the signatures being verified, the envelopes open, the ballots tabulated, and my personal favorite is the recount. <laughs> my staff doesn't necessarily love recounts as much as I do, but a hand recount is the most fascinating thing to watch. Because, you know, someone mentioned, well, we should be back on paper. Uh, there ain't no back to go to. We are on paper. We have paper ballots. And when we have a recount, 
we're hand counting those paper ballots and comparing it to what the machines tabulated. And again, go check the page on the website. There is very little difference when we do a hand recount to what those machines originally counted. And you, in um, this election cycle, have endorsed a nonpartisan candidate for Secretary of State, and you've talked before about um, supporting the idea of, of elections officials being nonpartisan, um, and yet you yourself are, are running as a Democrat. So can you talk about why you are doing that, and, and the idea of making something or making the office nonpartisan? Okay, so I'll start out by saying I normally do not endorse any position that's on the ballot, especially those that are local, because I count those votes. There are only two races in which I will endorse, and that is the state auditor and the secretary of state. I work with those two offices very closely, and truly the county auditors are the ones who know best who are people who will be good in that office. So I am supporting a nonpartisan candidate, and it's because she's the best candidate, the best person for the job. Many of the county auditors support taking the county auditor's position and the election's position nonpartisan. We would prefer not to have to be aligned with any particular political party because we serve all, not just one, and we want to be clear about that. So I do identify as a Democrat because this is a partisan position, and in the past, you had to declare us a, a, a party. And for those of you who've been around for a while, I am a Cecil Andrus Democrat. I am from North Idaho, and my absolute favorite person who served in public office is Cecil Andrus. Because he cared about his community, he was honest, he told it like it really was, and when he was wrong, he admitted it. And I do my best to follow in his incredibly large footsteps. And the auditor's office is a lot of other things other than elections. Um, so are there any changes, if you were elected again, to other uh, parts of the office that you would want to focus on? Oh, goody, the other three quarters of my office, thank you. <laughs> so besides elections, I've got reporting, motor vehicle licensing, and financial services. And in each one of those, we have so much that's happening. Uh, COVID really hit the Department of Licensing hard in so many different ways, I won't even go into it. So we're all still trying to rebuild our processes along with the state agency of Department of Licensing to make them work and make them work smoothly. In reporting, COVID finally pushed a lot of our customers, such as banks and title companies, to submitting their transactions electronically. So we're moving away from paper-based to electronic-based. The difference for you as homeowners is it can take weeks for that document to get to us, for us to look, to look at it, we look at it that same day, reject it, send it back because they messed something up, it goes through the mail, they have to fix it, it comes back. This can take weeks if there's a problem with that document. Electronic recording, that electronic record comes in, we look at it, and if there's a mistake, it's back to the submitter in 15 minutes. They correct it, it's back to us. Normally, even a document with a mistake takes 30 minutes. That means you get to move into your house that day rather than being told you're not going to get the keys for another couple of weeks. So that's some of the impact that reporting can have. Financial services, finally, we are looking at replacing our 20 plus year old financial system that is, uh, well, it's not exactly the most efficient thing, but it got us through Y2K. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So we are putting the, RF, the request for proposal out. Uh, I think it actually went out yesterday. And we will be getting a new accounting system where everything is actually integrated and works together. Um, thanks to a uh, the fact that the commissioners hired a new purchasing director a couple of years ago, we were finally able to move our payment process, the voucher that comes from the departments to pay the bills, it comes to my office, we process it and cut the check and send the check out. Thanks to that new purchasing director, 
we turn that entire process electronic. No more paper. It scans, it's electronic authorizations, and now we're paying electronically, and that got implemented two months before the COVID shutdown. Yeah, you wanna talk timing? Wow. So those are just some of the things that are happening. And what I wanna say is, even though I've been in the office for 24 years, every day is different in my office. There's so many different things happening. We provide a variety of services. And every day is another opportunity to do something better to make a change. And that's what we do. How are we doing on time? Okay, I'll ask one more elections related question, but um, what you know, do you think the auditor's role is in working with the public and the media to inform folks about how election systems or even just the auditor's office in general works and addressing some of the misinformation that we've seen in recent years. So, trying to figure out how to put information out there to the public has been the topic of conversation among the county auditors now for well over a year. And we have beat this thing up and beat it to death. And we are still working towards a solution that all 39 county auditors are working together and with the Secretary of State's office. And the Secretary of State's office is now taking the lead to help put information together, to put together a communication plan that we can all use to reach out to the various factions in our community to try to develop messages for those different factions. Because a message that works with one group will not work with and we are now recognizing that. We can't just put out a set of facts and think that's gonna have a significant impact. So as a group, we are really working together and I just recently um, hired a part-time communication specialist to help us with the messaging for Spokane area. Okay, well thank you so much for your time today. Mm -hmm. That's our time.